Hello everyone, welcome back to our very first medical sciences lecture of the new term and today we'll be focusing on the one-shot radiotherapy um, which is um, considered safer and as effective for treating breast cancer as the longer course. Um, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Anna Tran and I am a current um, third year MSI Applied Medical Sciences student here at UCL and also your chair for today's event. Um, today's fascinating lecture will discuss the evolution of a patient-centered treatment from an idea to worldwide adoption. And we want to keep these lectures as interactive as possible. So please make good use of Twitter and the Q&A function on Zoom throughout to submit your questions for our speaker. The hashtag to use on Twitter is hashtag FMS lectures. And also please be advised that today's presentation is being recorded and it will include surgical images. So just a quick heads up and a quick um, disclaimer for everyone. Now to um, introduce our speaker, we have Professor Jayant uh, Vedia is a professor of surgery and oncology at the UCL Division of Surgery, where he leads groundbreaking research in breast cancer surgery, radiotherapy and oncology at uh, UCL um, University College of London. He is a world renowned expert in the field of breast cancer and Along with his colleagues, he developed and scientifically tested the procedure of targeted intraoperative radiotherapy during lumpectomy for breast cancer. And this procedure has now been used to treat 45,000 breast cancer patients across 38 countries worldwide. And so thank you for joining us today, Professor Vavia, and now over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me see if my screen works. So this is a new way if we're doing this in which I can be seen on the slide and not uh, somewhere far away in the corner. So thank you very much for coming and uh, coming for this uh, virtual presentation. So we are talking about breakthrough, right? To be the breakthrough. So why is it a breakthrough? Because breast cancer affects a lot of women. Uh, just in 2018, 2 million people were diagnosed around the world and 626 women died of the disease. And over 10 years, this amounts to 6.3 million women. And it is not us, but this is National Institute of Health Research, listed five amazing breast cancer, um, amazing health research breakthroughs, and they included intraoperative radiotherapy as amongst these breakthroughs. And other, other breakthroughs which were included were the COVID vaccine and COVID treatments, completely unbeknown to us, so it was quite nice to have this accolade. So what am I going to talk about today? Firstly, what is the three things? Problem, what, is, what was the problem with standard treatment of breast cancer? The idea, the using targeted intraoperative radiotherapy, it's a new concept delivered by doing a new operation using a new machine. And the solution, the first thing is to test, trace and disseminate as opposed to COVID. So to test this in a randomized clinical trial, trace, investigate what the benefits have been proven and disseminate uh, that is worldwide adoption. It has taken 25 years, more than 25 years, and this talk will be in four or five different parts and I'll be moving from where I am in the corner to the side uh, for allow the slides to come. I want to start with acknowledgements. This is the multidisciplinary team which we had in UCLH Middlesex Hospital in March 2000 and it was extremely important for this team to have grown this. Uh, ideas and nurturing it throughout the time. These are the clinical teams from 33 centers in 11 countries, and each of them uh, contributed to this. This is the steering committee and the NIHR appointed steering committee. This is the writing committee and the, uh, all the authors of the papers uh, whose photographs are here. And this is the long list. And I cannot say all these names, but each person and others who have not been named have been very important for this to be brought uh, to fruition. And I cannot, unfortunately, due to GDPR compliance, tell the names of thousands of patients who contributed to this by participating in these randomized clinical trials. This is the potential conflict of interest, it's grant funding from UCL and honorary and reimbursement from Carl Zeiss. So let me start with this particular sentence that I would say or any doctor would say to a patient who is diagnosed with breast cancer. 
you have breast cancer. And this was back in 1991. And I was working at the time in Tata Memorial Hospital. So at this point, what is the patient thinking? She is thinking, can I come to the hospital every day for six weeks? If she could say yes, then we could preserve her breast. And if she said no, we need to do a mastectomy. Now, this is a problem. Why is this six weeks important? And for knowing this, you have to go back 130 years. Some of you may know this, William Halstead was a fantastic surgeon and a pioneer in doing radical surgery for breast cancer. So he invented the operation of radical mastectomy. And as a side story, this is Caroline Hampton, his chief nurse, whose hands were getting terribly causing dermatitis because of carbolic acid, so he invented gloves as well. And he then married his chief nurse. But importantly, in such operation theaters, he carried out operations for the cure of cancer of the breast. These were radical mastectomies. These were one of the few times when patients with breast cancer had uh, some relief from these ulcerating and fungating tumors. So radical mastectomy made a big difference to women with breast cancer, but it is disfiguring debilitating and patients sometimes couldn't move their arm properly, they had lymphedema. So radical mastectomy was challenged. The dogma of radical surgery was challenged in the latter half of the 20th century. And one of the pioneers here was Bernie Fisher. And they did randomized clinical trials and proved that doing lumpectomy and radiation was as effective as, giving, as doing mastectomy. But it took time for people to change from mastectomy to lumpectomy. So this is the point where we come to. The local treatment of breast cancer can be lumpectomy where radiotherapy is required or a mastectomy where radiotherapy is not usually required. And if one wants to preserve the breast, one needs to come for radiotherapy. And radiotherapy means you have to come every day to the hospital for three to six weeks. And this can be prohibitive. And, what, and this has made, made many patients choose a mastectomy instead. And should they have to do it? This is what led us to the idea of giving localized radiotherapy. This problem is not limited to India. It is there in Australia, in Denmark, in US, where people don't want to cross the Bay Bridge. And in UK, you can see these red circles. Each of them is a 13 mile radius. And people in the green area have to travel more than 13 miles, sometimes two hours a day, every day for three to six weeks for the radiotherapy. So it is a problem that affects us still. So this concern about patients Luckily, serendipitously coincided with the lab work in which whole organ analysis of mastectomy specimens was performed. And in this, what was found is that breast has many microscopic cancers. Yet, most recurrences, which are shown by red dots here, occur around the primary tumor. So we felt it is probably sensible to give radiotherapy only around the primary tumor. And this is what we published in 1996 and 1997, along with Professor Michael Baum and Professor Tobias. So this traveling daily for radiotherapy is onerous. So to recapitulate, many choose a mastectomy instead when local recurrence occurs in the, near the primary tumor. So this academic insight suggested that we should radiate only near the primary tumor. And the new idea was to give it during the lumpectomy procedure itself. And for this concept of target evolved and target is a short form for targeted intraoperative radiotherapy. So the device was created with industry collaboration, surgical technique was invented, and a randomized trial was performed. So that's the story I'm going to tell. So this happened on 2nd of July. This is the photograph of the first case. This is the tumor bed where the applicator goes in. That's how it looks in the operation theater. And here it is with me with Professor Michael Baum when I was much thinner. And this is with Professor Tobias in the operation theater performing the operation. So what we did was we challenged the dogma of radical radiotherapy in the last 25 years. As we moved from radical surgery to radical to more targeted surgery, in the last 25 years, we moved from radical radiotherapy to targeted radiotherapy. It follows the, the motto of UCL, disruptive thinking since 1826. So the cancer operation, patient has to go every day for three to six weeks of radiotherapy. And this is the point when I'm recapitulating. So we wanted to give radiotherapy during the operation itself. So this is the target technique. Radiotherapy is delivered immediately after lumpectomy. 
focus radiation is given to the tumor bed itself. It targets tissues at the highest risk of local recurrence and avoids normal tissues such as the heart and the lung based on the principle of precision and immediacy. In addition, it is individualized. So you choose the correct applicator for the correct tumor according to size of the patient's tumor bed. So this is how it looks in the operation theater. So this is the normal COVID gear that we have to use. It's COVID safe. And this is how it looks from the side. This is the machine. And this is how it looks uh, on the patient. So this covers the shield in order to protect the theater staff during the radiation. It is ideal during pandemic because it's done and dusted in the same time as your lumpectomy. So we published the technique and the first 25 patients and proved that it worked and it was safe to do so. So how do we test the effectiveness of target IORT? The gold standard for this is a randomized clinical trial. And in this we asked, can risk adapted intraoperative radiotherapy replace standard postoperative radiotherapy or not? The recruitment occurred between March 2000 to July 2012. So this is the gold standard where we compared target IORT versus whole breast radiotherapy so that every patient was randomly allocated to receive either this or that, and there was no other difference between the two arms of the trial. Finally, 2,298 patients participated in this. They had to be 45 years and older, and the tumor size should be less than three and a half centimeters in size. And this was the random allocation. So when you do such a randomized trial, in the beginning, we thought, of course, everybody will want to take part, but actually people said, these people are mad. So it was very slow. Then people started thinking there may be something here. And then slowly, people started participating. And over time, we had our accrual goal. So this followed the idea that first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. So I hope we are there at the last point now. So we published the first result in 2010. And that time, Lancet put our uh, results on the front page and gave the conclusion that for selected patients, these were the early results that target IORT should be used as an alternative to standard radiotherapy. Then it, this, it got a lot of publicity in several newspapers. So it made a lot of noise. People started using it more and more. We published the five-year results in 2013 where the initial conclusion was still valid. And then we were waiting and this also got a lot of publicity breakthrough. So more and more people started using it. Australia gave approval for intraoperative radiotherapy with government funding but we were still waiting for long-term results. During this time, the obvious benefits of target IORT were confirmed in the following studies. So these are the obvious benefits. We thought giving radiation to the smaller area would improve cosmetic outcome. And yes, that was borne out. Cosmetic outcome with intraoperative radiotherapy is superior to standard whole breast radiotherapy. Quality of life is superior with target IORT. These were separate studies by people in Germany, by clinicians and teams in Germany and in Australia. Patients have less pain, less breast and arm symptoms with target IORT. This was study from Copenhagen. The cost of target is lower. Sorry, there is, I think we missed two slides. Patients and doctors both prefer target IORT given a choice. So this is an important point. Patient preference is so important. Then we checked the cost. We found target is cost saving. In the US, radiotherapy costs a lot of money. So in US, the burden of radiotherapy, $1.4 billion would be saved over five years if target was used for suitable patients. The cost saving in the UK is less because it is cheaper to give radiotherapy, but it still would save about 9 million pounds per year. And this is interesting, that target reduces patients' travels. This is obvious, but we actually measured this. And here, uh, I want to thank my daughter who is here, whose photograph is here. She also helped me make some of these slides. So this is a small video recorded by Mr. Nathan Coombs. And he's, he's taken this video as if his patient is not going to travel. I realized that while I'd be driving this only once or twice a month, most of my patients will be asked to drive this at least three or four weeks um, for their radiotherapy. What a horrible journey I thought they had to put up with. 
So this is the journey in UK. Imagine how it is in other parts of the world. In UK, at least the, um, the roads are safer. And if we can save this journey, I say with the tongue in cheek, the target actually could reduce global warming. There is another interesting part, and this is the last part of this part of the presentation, that target improves chemo microenvironment. Now, this is a scary part for a surgeon. When we do surgery, the body tries to heal. And body trying to heal means it is stimulatory. What we found is the wound fluid, when we put it on breast cancer cell lines, it stimulates motility, invasiveness, and proliferation. But the good part was that if you take wound fluid in patients who have had intraoperative radiotherapy, this stimulatory effect of wound fluid is abrogated. And you can see here, although you may not be able to find the difference between these two, the top one cells are moving much faster than the bottom ones as seen in these diagrams where it was objectively tested. So cells are less invasive, less motile, and less proliferative if they receive intraoperative radiotherapy. So this is uh, a way in which it could work even more than what standard radiotherapy would work. So I'm going to move back to the other uh, slide now. Right, so, so we have talked about a randomized trial. Patients were randomized between year 2000 to July 2012. And these are the long-term outcomes. For long-term outcomes, it is very important that the follow-up is complete. Randomization occurred from March 2000, so we have long-term follow-up. And we set the bar for completeness of follow-up really very high and monitored it. Teams from all over the world helped in getting this high level of completeness. And most importantly, team from the Surgical Intensive, Surgical Interventional Trials Unit in UCL, each, each of them was blood, sweat, and toils. toil. They really, really made, made sure that we got a very high level of completeness. So target A, consequently has one of the largest amount of follow-up information about how patients have done for a long time in all, a comment to all similar trials. So here there are other people who have done trials giving localized radiation, and you can see how good this skyscraper graph looks in which each graph tells you how many patients have been followed up for as many years. So this is better than all these other trials. Another important point about the number of patients who participate in these trials, but there was a substantial proportion of patients with high risk of local recurrence. They were not the patients who were very low risk of local recurrence. There were a lot of patients who were young patients who had grade three cancers, many with positive nodes or ER negative cancers. So this meant that this trial population represented the typical patients representative of breast clinics. So this is a trial which, is, which happened all over the world. So it is, the results are generalizable all over the world. So we have seen the advantages uh, of target A. It, it is the surgery and radiotherapy is completed at the same time. There is less travel, which is a huge advantage during a pandemic such as COVID. There is better cosmetic outcome. There is less pain, there are fewer complications, less toxicity. So what else do we need? The important question that patient has in her mind is what is my chance of living without the cancer coming back? So here are the long-term results. So they were published in the British Medical Journal after thorough peer review. And they were also published earlier this year in British Journal of Cancer, where we gave more detailed analysis. And I'm going to tell some of these analysis in this talk. So for, I'm going through a few graphs now. And in order to understand these graphs, it is not, uh, I'm going to explain slightly how they are plotted. So the y-axis here is a survival, 100% is on top. And as the years pass, a few people are still alive and that is 12 years. And what we are comparing here is the blue and the, the purple and the pink line. And every time a patient has an event, such as as a local recurrence or dies, the line goes down a bit. If the lines separate, that means there's a difference. If they don't separate, there is no difference. So the first question is, what is the chance of remaining free, cancer-free in the breast? And what is found is this local recurrence with survival, there was no difference in the local control of breast cancer at all. So this is an excellent, this was the primary endpoint. And this is what we found, no difference in terms of cancer control in the breast. And it did not matter what type of tumor it was, whether it was whatever the size, the grade, lymph node, ER, PR, or HER2 status. 
The local control was the same in all these subgroups. Now, local control is important because local relapse after whole breast radiotherapy does confer a poor prognosis to patients. But remember, that is for patients after whole breast radiotherapy or after no radiotherapy. So in the trial, we did find that long-term risk of death, breast cancer death, after whole breast radiotherapy is high. It goes up all the way, okay? But what was good was long-term hazard of after local relapse of the rare times when it occurred after target IORT was the same as if they had no local recurrence. So that showed us that the outlook, even after the rare local recurrence, after having a target IORT remains excellent. It's as good as having no, no local recurrence at all. So this was a good news. Then the next question patient will ask, what is the chance of my preserving the breast for the next so many years? And as you can see, these lines are overlapping. So there's no difference in breast preservation rate with target IORT versus whole breast radiotherapy. Next question is, what is the chance of remaining free of disease cancer coming elsewhere in the body? And again, there is no difference between the two arms of the trial here. Breast cancer mortality. The difference between this and the other graphs is that this is expanded. This is 20%. It was 100% in the other graphs. Here it is 20%, so it's magnified. This was done at the request of the BMJ. We find breast cancer mortality is no different between the two groups, that is target IORT and EBRT. But this was the good news. The deaths from other causes, such as cardiovascular causes, lung cancers, lung problems, other cancers were far fewer with target IORT compared to whole breast radiotherapy. And this is a big difference of nearly halving such deaths, 9.85% versus 5.41%. And this difference is not a surprise. Why is it not a surprise? Because harmful effects of scattered irradiation following breast radiotherapy are well known and documented for many years. It affects the heart and the coronary arteries. So you can see here, Perfusion defects that is diff damaging the blood supply to the heart occurs within six months of normal radiotherapy. This is old radiotherapy techniques. Even new, it has not been proven that it doesn't happen. It can cause cancers of the lung, the esophagus, and sarcoma. And this is increased so many more times. And so this scattered irradiation is avoided with, with target IORT. So it is not a surprise that we find fewer deaths. Now this increase in heart attacks and lung cancers is significantly more if you have been a smoker. So there's a 6% increase in deaths due to whole breast radiotherapy. So I believe really the benefit of target IOT is so much more if you're a smoker. And I think for smokers, this is really the only, only safe option. If radiotherapy is causing this harm, is no radiotherapy a good idea? Well, this randomized trial, PRIME2 shows that it is not. If you give no radiotherapy, even to the highly selected good prognosis patients, at the end of 10 years, 10% people get a local recurrence. And they don't even have the benefit of avoiding the radiotherapy, perhaps because this increased local recurrence leads to some breast cancer deaths. So it's not a good idea to give no radiotherapy. Patients, do patients want no radiotherapy? This has been looked at. So when patients are offered no radiotherapy, Three quarters of the patients chose target IORT. Only a few chose whole breast radiotherapy and even fewer chose no radiotherapy. So if your patients are being offered no radiotherapy, it is not really a good thing. So it's not a good idea. There is another way you can give radiotherapy is give it in a shortened five day regimen. It's called fast forward. Actually, I'm not sure it's fast forward. It's a bit backward because it is giving radiation to the whole breast. Scattered irradiation still occurs to vital organs. And in the trial, more people reported hardened and firm breasts up to a quarter. And it is such induration, according to the doctors assessing it also was much higher and we don't have long-term data. So it's not a good idea. There are other methods of giving partial breast radiation using such things like these wires put in the breast. Now, I think when patients are given a choice, they should be shown these diagrams, these photographs to decide which one they want. It is additional procedure and there is no reduction in deaths. You can give it from a using existing machines from outside, but again, there is still scattered irradiation and no benefit of reducing deaths and still needs many visits to the hospital. Whereas we target, you have excellent breast cancer control and fewer deaths from other causes. Now there's one more important outcome. 
that if you have patients which are grade one or grade two, that is the better prognosis patients, which formed a majority of patients in the trial, 1,800 patients, there was an overall survival benefit of nearly 4%. Now, one may think, is this 4% to contextualize it? This number is very similar to the improvement that patients get for ER positive patients, less than two centimeter, if they're given Herceptin. You may have heard of Herceptin, it's an expensive drug, and it's given over a course of one year. It costs about 15,000 pounds in the UK, but $50,000 in the US. It can hurt the heart, but as target is actually cost-saving and protects the heart. So the benefit is to the patient is very similar. So our original results of 2010 were now confirmed. What we have found is that target IORT is now widely applicable whenever a patient is planned to have a lumpectomy, but they should be told about it, informed about it before the operation because it is done during the operation. The breast cancer control is comparable to the traditional long course. There are substantially fewer non-breast cancer deaths. They substantially improved overall survival if grade one or two, and excellent prognosis even after the rare local relapse. Of course, there are other benefits of less pain, better cosmetic outcome, better quality of life. It's more convenient for the patient, less travel time, and of course, less global warming. And there is lower cost to the patient, out-of-pocket costs, as well as to the healthcare system. So these are the benefits. And of course, this made a lot of news. It was on top of the um, uh, front page of the Times. And people have asked, what is the downside then? Well, it challenges the dogma. And that leads to inertia. And it is in line with the UCL's thinking. So it is this is the problem. And this is a statement by the chief editor of the top radiotherapy journal that depending on perspective, it could either be a quantum leap forward or a serious threat. But despite this, it has been uh, considered as an innovative treatment, better than other PBI approaches, and it should be practice changing. And people around the world are using this. So these are real world studies from China where they have found it's effective, USA, Russia, France, Europe, these are long-term data. And these are photographs of clinicians and uh, teams, hospital teams who have been using this as standard of care. And we have been meeting together since uh, many years. And these are photographs in various parts of the world. You can see here, this is in the US, this is in Germany, this is in Bangkok, this is in Las Vegas, this is in Mannheim and Florida. And this was the last one just before the pandemic where we met together in New Orleans. So this is an important take home, is that target IORT is now adopted all over the world. Each dot here represents a center which has treated patients. And I've contacted all of them and they've told me the number of patients they have treated. And that number comes to about 45,000 patients in 260 centers from 38 countries worldwide. So this is, this is really, good that this is being used and offered to patients. In the US, they, adver they advertise it as one of the things that they offer. In the UK, they're good at innovation, but usually slow at adopting. But in 2014, NICE made a recommendation, a draft recommendation. And in January, 2018, it recommended it should be used in centers that have the equipment and the expertise. And in this year, as, as I said before, National Institute of Health Research included Target as one of the five amazing healthcare breakthroughs in the last 12 months, in, along with COVID treatments and vaccine. And if you follow the GMC guidance, NICE guidance and the law in which everybody should be given options that are uh, considered reasonable, Target IoT should be made available to patients whenever it is suitable for them. I want to end by showing a small video clip of uh, one of the patients and who is an author on one of these papers as well. You can scan this to get in touch or you can send me an email at gmail.com. And this talk which I gave was about target A. There is a target B trial that is currently running in patients who are younger or at a very high risk of local recurrence. And this trial is again funded by NIHR we have already recruited nearly 1,450 patients in 38, in 38 centers in 15 countries, even during COVID. And this, this, if this works, 
we are testing whether it is actually better to give this in addition to whole breast in high risk patients because it is given at the right time at the right place. So the last part will be a, a small video from a patient. I'm Marcel Bernstein. Eight years ago, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. I had it for two months only before I was cured. I had target IORT at the same time as the operation to remove the cancer. I spent one night in hospital and I was back at work within days. No pain at any time, no complications, no scarring. I can't even tell where on my breast the surgery was and no recurrence, eight years. And that isn't just me being lucky. Studies show that my experience is similar to that of other women who've had target. I am so happy I was able to have this treatment. Right, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are, I think we are finished in time for us to have uh, a good Q&A session. And I'm happy to answer questions now or later. Thank you so much for um, such an insightful lecture. So this target IORT um, radiotherapeutic method has clearly uh, revolutionized medicine and has improved the lives of many people that have undergone this procedure. So now onto the questions that have been sent in from you guys whilst Professor Vadia has been speaking. And we've got a question from Arjun that looks kind of further into the future and beyond target IORT. Um, Arjun asks, what other breakthroughs do you think this will lead to in the future? Well, uh, this particular treatment, in addition to breast, has been used in the brain, for example, in glioblastoma. It has been used for the spine, where it, it seems to have, and when it is given intraoperatively for spinal metastases, which are very, very painful, it seems to have a big effect on immediately reducing the pain. There is yet another point, which I didn't have enough time to go through, is that the effect on the wound fluid seems to have a systemic effect in reducing, uh, producing an effect that makes fewer deaths from other causes. And we are yet to understand how this abscopal effect works. Abscopal is away from the site of radiation, but uh, that is something we will know in the target B trial as well. So there could be some ways in which we can make new drugs by finding out what changes occurred in the wound fluid after radiotherapy. Thank There's you. also a follow-up uh, question from that one, and um, it is, could this be applicable to prostate cancer in the future? Well, it could well be applicable to prostate cancer. It is being used in rectal cancer, uh, but it could well be applicable in prostate cancer using small applicators. Yes, indeed. Um, there's, we have a question on the um, technology behind IORT. So does IORT administer the same amount of radiation to the breast as EBRT or less, as it only targets a smaller area? Well, it targets the a therapeutic dose of radiation to the area which is focused. Whole breast radiotherapy gives radiation to the whole breast. This gives 20 gray immediately to the tissues next to the tumor bed. So that radiobiologically is considered uh, adequate for controlling the tumor and proof of the pudding is in eating. So after having had such a long follow-up up to 20 years, if you find that it stops the cancer from coming back as well as standard radiotherapy, it is effective without having to give unnecessary radiation to the surrounding nearby vital organs. The idea is here to give it targeted rather than scattered. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. So Follow on, following on from that, uh, we've got a question possibly um, you could reiterate. So are there any side effects to uh, target IORT? For instance, is there longer patient recovery time? Right, so firstly, the patient doesn't really realize that they have had this, whether they have this operation without radiotherapy or with radiotherapy. There is no pain difference, nothing at all. In fact, there is less pain when you give this radiotherapy compared with whole breast radiotherapy. We, when we started this back in 1998, were, were worried about wound healing because we are giving radiation. And we have found that as long as we make sure that the technique is correct, the skin is actually kept away from the radiation field. So we keep the skin 0.8 to 10 millimeters, 0.8 to uh, one, milli, uh, one centimeter away. So once you do that, the skin heals and 
there is no wound, wound healing problems. In the randomized trial, we didn't have wound healing problems differently. There's slightly more fluid collection, but that is at the level of 1% uh, versus 0.8%, that sort of a number. So really no difference. So through these randomized trials that have, um, that have been uh, studied, uh, did the patients from these trials experience any local recurrence from the novel, no, uh, from the, uh, novel therapy? Yes, this is what we looked at. So the local chance of remaining free without local recurrence in the two arms was the same. So at five years, 94.2% people were alive without local recurrence in target IORT and 94.2% were alive without local recurrence when they were randomized to have EBRT. In terms of actual number of local recurrence, there was 2% versus 1%, but there was 1% less deaths with target IORT. So do you think that this treatment would be easily implemented globally at affordable rates for the general public? That's a very important question. It is actually cheaper to give this treatment to patients because the equipment is significantly less cheap, less expensive. It's a fraction of a cost of a linear accelerator, which is normally used for whole body radiotherapy. It is, it's a mobile device. So it, is, it costs less to the NHS to give it to people and it costs less for people to access it. So it can sometimes be a reverse uh, incentive that you don't make as much money with it, the hospitals. But uh, importantly, it is something that is adoptable around the world at a rate cheaper than whole breast radiotherapy. It is important to get the machine. And if it's used for brain and bowel and colon and skin, then it will be used for um, other parts of the spell. But it requires to be brought. It's not bought. At present, these machines were bought many times through charity and so on. But it's important to recognize that there are 260 centers around the world who are using it as standard of care. So um, now if we zoom into the UK, somewhere more locally to us, uh, how available is the equipment um, that involves IORT is to uh, deliver the intraoperative radiotherapy in the UK? As I said, we have been slow to implement. Um, in the NHS, there is one hospital at present is available in, uh, in Winchester and, uh, and in, it's available in the private sector because insurance companies want to pay for this rather than pay for the standard radiotherapy. Uh, so, uh, but it is nice is reviewing all the new uh, results now and hopefully it should be rolling out uh, to more easily available in the, US, in the UK. In Germany, there are 65 centers using it. In US, there are 80 centers. It's used in Singapore, it's used in uh, South Korea, China, everywhere. So it, as usual, we have been a bit slow in adopting it, but it will, I'm really, really optimistic that it will get adopted everywhere in the UK as well. It was being used, a lot of patients in the trial were randomized in the trial itself uh, from UK. So, um, yeah. So what was the biggest challenge in applying these treatment all over the world? The challenge initially was the skepticism whether giving radiation only to this area is going to be enough. It is similar to the challenge if people didn't want to shift from mastectomy to lumpectomy, people are reluctant to do less treatment because it, they are fearful that it might harm the patient because we may not give enough treatment. But now, the first results have been confirmed and amplified that it is enough to give this treatment. People want to use it because everybody recognizes how good it is for patients. So this is a usual way. We changed from having axillary clearance in everybody to do only a sentinel node biopsy. So for moving all the lymph nodes, we are doing less. So we're doing what is minimum required for the patient's outcome to improve their quality of life, at the same time, reduce side effects and improve the quality of, uh, uh, keep the survival same or better. So if we were to, let's say, go back in time, so let's rewind. So uh, what was the success pre-clinic, uh, the pre-clinical success before entering any ran randomized clinical trials for IORT? So what we knew beforehand, even if you did, we knew anything, radiotherapy works. Giving radiotherapy in addition to surgery makes a difference. So the conceptually, this was to give radiotherapy, which was very well known, to only some area. So this was the conceptual idea. So it was not a new, it's not a new drug where you have to test it in mice or in cells. We knew it is radiation, so we knew it would kill. 
So we did the first, first, first we did a phase two study to prove that it is safe to do this in an operation theater in terms of wound healing and so on. And then we launched the randomized clinical trial to compare it with standard radiotherapy. So here the test was not to see whether this drug is um, safe in mice or not. We didn't do this in mice. It has been done in mice for uh, looking at its biology and that has also shown similar good results. But we didn't have to do that before we started treating patients. So we've learned about all the um, amazing impacts of IORT, um, but are there any certain circumstances that target IORT is not an option that can be provided to patients? Indeed. So if a patient is due to have a mastectomy, we can't do this. If patient has certain types of tumors, we don't know whether it works as well as, or not. These are less common tumors like invasive lobular cancer, pure invasive lobular cancers. We, we excluded them initially because those used to be widespread all over the breast. Nowadays in the US and in many parts of the world, when they're single localized areas, people are thinking of using it, but the randomized trial had only 120 such patients. Although it worked well in them in the trial, it's not um, yet considered a standard for invasive lobular cancer. So patients who have had previous chemotherapy can take part in target B trial. Invasive lobular cancer can take part in target B trial. And patients younger than 45, we have very few of them in the trial, although there is no a priori reason why it shouldn't work, they also can take part in target B trial at present. So they receive part of the radiation during the operation. Amazing. So we have a question from Scarlett. Um, so she asks, I understand that EBRT can cause hardness to breasts and scarring. Do you see a similar effect on the inside of the breast when IORT is used or are the effects different? All right. So the scarring doesn't happen in everybody, even with EBRT. It happens in some people who are slightly more predisposed to it. As the similar proportion of people would be predisposed to have similar hardening in IORT. And in the trial, we found similar hard was hardening was no different between the two groups. So the rate of hardening was to a much smaller area, but it occurred in a similar number of people. But the good part was in the in whole breast radiotherapy, it affected the whole breast. Here it affects only a small part. And many times this hardening, which can occur with IORT, we have seen become softer as the years progress. In terms of cosmetic outcome, we found it is superior with target IORT, yeah. So you could answer this question in the context of just specifically IORT or also generally across the medical field. Um, but do you think that the medical field um, or IORT is focusing more on patient-centered care? And how do you think this benefits patients and their families? Well, I always thought care doctors are supposed to be only patient-centered. I don't know of any other approach anyway. And, but uh, the word patient-centered has now been more and more popular in the last 10 years, which I feel is really good. There can't be any other type of care, according to me. It should be always patient-centered. But uh, I, can, I can understand what, why it is being used because sometimes care is based around how the care can be given in a particular hospital. So, um, whereas how the care can be given to the particular patient in the way which helps them makes it better. So move the care nearer the patient. And in some way, this, this follows that, that if this is available in every local hospital, patients don't have to keep traveling to the every radiotherapy center. And that is what has happened. Uh, places where don't have radiotherapy have had this treatment. It can be carried. In Zurich, they had one machine moving between two hospitals. So uh, when they started, yeah. It all sounds very futuristic. <laughs> and it is, yeah, we've so been doing it for 20 years now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with the um, randomized uh, controlled trials that has happened uh, with IORT, um, Ishan is asking whether that ram those randomized trials were double-blinded. Well, they were, they were not double-blinded because it is, it is, that's a very interesting question because the surgeon has to know that he was giving the radiotherapy during the operation, so he can't be blind. And... Uh, so it is not, it is, it's not blinded, the treatment arm is not blinded. Now, what is important to recognize is that a double blinded or single blinded trials are important when the endpoints are soft. By soft, 
I mean pain or uh, symptoms such as I'm getting feeling slightly better. But if the endpoints are hard as local recurrence, cancer coming back proven with a biopsy or death, these, is, these are hard endpoints which one cannot be influenced by blinding. As long as you have complete follow-up and complete follow-up of all the patients, it is blinding would not have an effect on hard endpoints. So uh, it is not necessary for such trials to be double blinded. I hope that answers the question. So um, we know that IORT is used in cancer treatments. Yeah. Um, we've got one listener that was asking whether we could use IORT as a prophylaxis of cancer in the future. Uh, I wouldn't say that the case just now. Radiotherapy is, uh, is a very um, strong um, treatment. And at present, uh, no, I wouldn't advise this as a prophylactic, no. Perhaps the drugs that change, the chemicals that change during the wound, if you find that that has a prophylactic effect, we may be able to use those drugs in the future. Someone has asked whether RCT is still running. No, the RCT stopped randomizing in 2012. So we are following those patients up until now. So patients, this is now being used as standard of care in these centers, yeah. And the local recurrence is, uh, chance of being free of local recurrence is the same in the two arms. So now we're moving a bit a bit away from the IRT um, yeah. kind of content, uh, but because you're such a breast cancer specialist, we've got a question from an anonymous listener, hmm. and is uh, why do press why do breast cancer patients experience arm pain? Arm pain. Right. So breast cancer patients can experience arm pain for because of various reasons. When uh, breast cancer is treated. Um, if a mastectomy is done, it can cause injury or manipulation of the muscles which, which move the arm, like pectoralis major muscle. And if that takes time to heal and if there is no good physiotherapy, then it can cause shoulder stiffness. Um, the second reason can be because nerves supplying the arm are, can be disturbed while surgery is done under the arm for removing the lymph nodes. And that can cause sometimes rarely persistent arm pain. And thirdly, if lymph nodes are removed, there can also be lymphedema, collection of fluid, and that can lead to dull aching pain as well. And most of these are not common. Arm pain is not a common thing after surgery for breast cancer. I hope that's a good question. So we have a, another question. Um, so it's, it's something that's a bit more reflective. So what inspired you to design or invent such an intricate maneuver that in, such as IORT? Okay, well, that's what I was trying to say. I was the chief resident in Tata Hospital in Bombay, where I had to tell patients, you have breast cancer and ask the next question, can you stay in Bombay, as we called it then, Mumbai, for six weeks after the operation? That was the first question after giving them the diagnosis. If they said yes, we could say we can preserve your breast. If they said no, we had to say, we have to give you mastectomy because if you can't have radiotherapy, giving only lumpectomy would mean you have a high local recurrence rate. So that made me think many times about this problem. And at the same time, and when and I did work in the lab that suggested that maybe we can give radiotherapy only to the tumor. And it was serendipity. I worked with Professor Michael Baum and Professor Jeffrey Tobias when I come, came to the UK and I told them this idea. They said, oh, there's a company who's interested in um, developing a treatment for breast cancer. It was serendipitous. It was luck and the passion to do something new. So, and that just came together at the right time. And we said, okay, if this is the concept and this machine, so let us make a machine to give the radiotherapy during the surgery. That's how it happened. It's just that we, we got together at the right time at the right place. And, uh, Professor Baum is very well known in the field. Uh, he's uh, done a lot of work and Professor Tobias, the radiation oncologist and without, uh, and several people came together to support this uh, at the right time, at the right place. So that's what happened really. And one has to persist and have a passion for it. I don't know whether that's answered the question or not, but <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's answered it perfectly. It was, you were kind of telling a story as to how you got to this point. 
so if we were to compare IORT with the um, other um, type, treatment types that are already well known. So how efficient is this um, IORT one-shot radiotherapy compared to um, nanodrug delivery systems, for example? Oh, they're completely di different uh, ideas. IORT and surgery are there for local treatment of breast cancer in the breast. Various drug delivery systems are meant to give treatment for the whole body, for the cancer not to come back in the body. So the treatment of breast cancer is two parts. One is local treatment in the breast and one is for rest of the body. It may be possible to give nano drug delivery to the area around the tumor when we may not even need to do surgery. Yes, that's possible, not yet come into practice. Uh, so it is something that uh, one can look forward to. Yeah, somebody asked whether the patient needs to be hospitalized. Yes, that's possible. And some parts of the world, that's what happens. They, are, they come and stay in the hospital for five days, not five days, for 15 days. Uh, that's a, quite a lot to uh, provide for by the health system and quite a lot for the patient to go through for that. Yes, it's an important point. Yeah. So whilst you are studying IORT, where and in which patient groups has this technique been pioneered? Well, it has been it has been used in patients who have suitable have lumpectomy. That is, a, the lump is not too big, and we can do removal of the cancer with some normal tissue around it, and still leave a, um, uh, enough breast tissue around. So, in those other patients who, and so most of the such patients would be suitable, unless the cancer is so big that we have to do a lumpectomy, or if it's a special type of cancer like lobular cancer. So, in, in terms of geographical regions, which uh, patient groups across the world have you focused on in terms of um, ethnicity so been, or nationalities? It's been used in um, 260 centers in about uh, 100 countries. So it's been used in Europe, it's been used in South Africa, it's been used in the Far East, in the Middle East, uh, it's been used in India, Australia, US, uh, South America. So it is used in uh, most parts of the world. Um, so but not everywhere. In some, some countries, it's used a lot, like Germany, France, Spain, US. Uh, so uh, these countries, it's used more than usual. If patient pressure is there and there is um, competition between hospitals, then um, hospitals in the US want to get it because for patients, it's so much better and they would get more patients for it. Yeah. Okay. So do you think with IORT, do you think there's potential for you to uh, conduct further studies in other regions beyond what you've already yes. um, investigated? So, so uh, it is being tested for glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive brain tumor. It's been uh, being used for rectal cancer and we are using it for high risk young patients, as I said, in target B trial, which is again funded by NIHR and Department of Health. And what we would be very interested to know is the biological effects on wound fluid as well. So that is also being studied. Yep, so um, we've got a few questions uh, from the attendees and I, I usually ask this to every um, guest that I usually chair anyway, uh, but how was your journey um, in, in terms of becoming a surgeon? How did you become uh, who you are now? Well, in the I medical was- field? <laughs> Well, I was deciding whether I'm going to become a scientist or a doctor first. And uh, so I decided that I can become a doctor and also become a scientist, but wouldn't it would be difficult to be other way around. So I became a doctor and a scientist. And then I realized that as a surgeon, there's one nice thing is that you start doing something good for somebody in about an hour or two, you finish doing it. You get a packet of joy. Every time you do an operation, you get a packet of joy. And which is not easy if you are a physician where you start somebody on a tablet and you know that you're doing as good, maybe even better than what a surgeon would do, but you solve a physical problem right there and then with your hands. And I was told my hand skill is good. So that's how I became a surgeon and a cancer surgeon there, there is more research. So I was very keen on doing research. So that's why I chose cancer where there is not many things are known, whereas many things are known already. So it's a good place to start. I think it's quite a common dilemma to have um, with uh, science students, whether to choose to be a scientist or, or medical student, but I'm glad that you found a very good balance of both now. 
Um, um, we're quite short on time, so I've got one last question just to reflect on the whole kind of um, IORT that you've been enlightening us with. So how does it feel to know that you are part of such an incredible therapy discovery, which has helped so many patients? Oh, it's, it's still not sinking in. Otherwise, I would be, my head would become too big. So it's nothing. It's just, I just followed what is to be done. And um, yeah, anybody in the right place at the right time would do the same. Uh, so it is, um, but most important thing is remain optimistic. Always remain optimistic. It's very easy to get cynical. Uh, so never become cynical. It's remain positive and just keep persisting and persevering. That's all I would say. And um, just see the positive side all the time. I think that is, um, yeah, yeah, despite what is going on around us. <laughs> yeah, a lot of good things. Yep. It'll only get better. Exactly, the only way is up. Yeah. Okay, uh, very sadly, we're out of time. So we'll need to leave it there. However, if you could please provide us with your feedback about today's session, by filling out our survey, which will be sent to you following today's session. It will be greatly appreciated. Um, also, we do have another lecture taking place at 5 p.m. So at the same time as it was today on the 9th of November, titled, Should We Still Care About HIV? Which the obvious, the, I, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. So uh, we would love to see you there. And also please uh, do book your place on our website if you want to attend that. And thank you for all your comments and questions. And thank you to Professor Vedia for an, for an excellent lecture. Uh, have a great evening, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.